Hey, thanks for coming this afternoon. I know afternoon sessions can be interesting. It's the end of the whole thing. You're probably brain is melted. Is your brain's kind of melted? They should be. You can't, if, you're, if you've come to pass and your brain is not melted, you need to come talk to me of going to the right sessions. <laughs> so your brain's thoroughly melted. So quick, I want to just say one quick, that's why you're here. One quick pre-apology. I've had 10 sessions across two events this week. My voice is on the brink, so I'm gonna drink a lot of water in between if you don't mind. I think I'm gonna make it though. I'm just gonna push through this thing. But if you see me feel a little raspy, it's just because I've just been talking a lot, which my wife says all the time. You actually do that all the time. I told her last night, she goes, maybe you shouldn't talk so much. I'm sorry, I got 10 sessions to do. So hey, I'm Bob Ward from Microsoft. Thanks for coming this afternoon. When I thought about building this talk, I thought of a couple things. One, there are talks at events like this that I have to do as part of my job. And I like doing them, trust me. I like talking about our new innovations, things we're doing, new technologies, AI, you name it. But I get to choose one that I really wanna do. And one that maybe not cover like the latest stuff, but things maybe that have been out there, or things you're using now, but are more practical. So I thought, what am I gonna do this year? Last year was like a debugging session, right? This year I thought, okay, what do I hear a lot about that people maybe are not getting all the facts straight about? And to me, what I've heard over the last even couple years is this topic here, availability groups. Couple things logistically. It is gonna be so tempting for you to stop me and ask a question like, hey, I've got this AG with three nodes and a multi suburb network and this isn't working right and so forth. Please, let's not do those questions in this session, okay? Bob Ward at Microsoft.com. I commit to you, and if you know me well enough, if you've got a question at AG that's really in depth about a specific situation, send me an email. I promise you, I will answer you. Maybe after the holidays, but I will address it. So if you could, we'll take a couple of breaks during the session today to answer questions, but if you can keep it focused on what I'm presenting today for you. Again, it doesn't mean I'm trying to turn you down from asking a question. I'll take the hardest questions in the world. But if we get rat into a very specific situation, we'll never get through all this stuff. Second, what about the deck? What about the demos? I've got some cool demos to show. Yes, I'm going to show some call stacks. Not a debugger, but at least some call stacks, right? Like, how did he do that stuff? Well, right there, Bob Ward MS, that site. We'll take a second, let you take a photo of it. The entire deck I just uploaded in the speaker room. And the demos are in the deck. They're all recorded. And if you unmute them on a Sunday, you can take a nap and listen to me go on and on about always on availability groups, right? So everything's in there. And if you have questions when you see it later, like how did you do that? You can ping me. I'll show you the steps of how I produce those together. A couple of quick things about this slide. The right is an O to what happened in 2005, something called database mirroring. I remember being in CSS in those days when we launched that feature. And I remember distinctly, Steve Lindell, who's now retired from Microsoft, who was a big developer of that feature, came to me in CSS around 2008. And we just 2008 and said, Bob, we're going to rewrite this. <clears throat> and what is it called? He goes, it's going to be called Hadron. Hadron. High availability disaster recovery on. Hence became always on availability groups. But back in 2008, we thought about rewriting this feature, making it more robust and mirroring, including the support for things like clustering support. That's kind of a legacy of where this all started. And in fact, some of the resources you'll see throughout the deck and at the end of the deck <clears throat> pay tribute to something like the Hadron Learning Series my colleague Bob Dorr wrote. There's so much content we built for so many years out there on the details of this stuff. It was kind of fun to go back and try to find some of the things to put this and stitch this together. So anyways, that's the context of what we're going to do today. Let's see if we can have some fun. <clears throat> so here's what we're going to do. A little bit about a why. Why do I think maybe people are using this? It's going to include a discussion on da -da, licensing. Bob Ward's going to talk about licensing. Yes, that's one thing I think you should know about that maybe some are confused on. <clears throat> Number two, how does it work? That's the fun part, right? Data synchronization and failover. There were some fun demos I'm going to show you about how to trip it up, suspend data movement, look at worker threads, look at call stacks, some of those things. How does it work behind the scenes? <clears throat> and then finally, there's some extended availability group stuff I want to talk about. I want to make sure no matter what we do, at the end, I get to a demo to show you the public preview of the managed instance link feature for bi-directional disaster recovery. I have built the demo, I wanna show you how it works. Um, here's a tip. I promise you right now in this room, whoa, did I get it? Oh, I dropped my battery. I promise you in this room right now that there is somebody that probably knows available groups more than I do. And I know people in the community do from this perspective. They deploy it all the time. They see it out in the wild. You pick a guy like Alan Hurt, who goes out there in the industry and does this for customers, follow their advice, look at their expertise, see how they practically do this. This is a talk more about what I think you should know about it to make sure we bust some myths about how does it work, maybe how it doesn't work, 
What could it be used for? How do you license it, et cetera? <clears throat> so here's what I hope to bust. It requires a cluster, wrong. It's only supported an enterprise, not true. It only works on Windows and requires a domain, not true as well. It always requires a SQL license, not true. You can't have high performance apps, that's not true as well. Transactions are held up if a secondary goes offline, that's not true. You must manually synchronize instance objects, not anymore. And they're not compatible with other features. Did you know when I put that on this first slide, when I first built this two weeks ago, three weeks ago, <clears throat> I tried to, as hard as I could, find all the features that didn't work with AGs. It's kind of hard nowadays to do that, actually. So I don't even have a slide that actually says what doesn't work with AGs. Maybe you've run into something you should tell me about, but it was very difficult to actually go find that. <clears throat> and then finally, I always need to manage the AG in the cloud, and we'll talk a little bit about how we do things in the PaaS service kind of at the very end of the session today. So these are the myths that I think, that I hear people talk about, that I hope to bust in today's session. So why availability groups? This is what people tell me, I don't know about you, but this is a shared nothing architecture, different than a failover cluster instance, which means faster RTO and RPO. And most importantly, I get to use the other instance for something. It, things like read workloads or backups or check DB. And it could offer me the ability to do an online move or a migration or an upgrade or even a rolling upgrade or a patch. So out in the wild today, when people tell me, when I get into a big customer meeting, like why should I use this? This is the kind of stuff we talk about or even setting up disaster recovery along with this. Maybe those are familiar to you. You're like, yeah, sure, Bob. That's why I use it. That's why I chose it. But it's what I actually hear from even executives about why would this technology be used? And it's why in the cloud for past services like database and managed instance, we use this actually behind the scenes to make some of our SLA successful. <clears throat> okay, what about licensing? Like what is licensing doing a Bob Ward talk? It's because I see confusion around this and it's not your fault. So first of all, did you know developer edition can be used for this? You can do developer and test scenarios with dev edition with an availability group. It is possible, I've done it. In fact, the demos I did on Azure were all with developer edition. So if you think that's not possible, you can to develop and test an AG scenario. Again, it can't be used for production. You can do evaluation as well, not for production. And certainly enterprise supports it, but maybe you didn't know that standard supports it. Now it is a basic availability group, which means you get one and it's gotta be passive. So it's just gotta be sitting there waiting for a DR or an availability scenario, but it is possible to actually do that. Now this is the one that people usually don't know about. <clears throat> There's a concept now called passive secondary. If you've got software assurance or Azure hybrid benefit, you do not have to have a SQL license for a passive secondary. Any supported addition, and of course it wouldn't be for developer purposes, right? But one is free for availability, okay, like a failover, and one free for DR. And if you want to extend it to Azure, you get an additional free for DR. Now what does that actually mean? What does passive mean? It means you really can't use it except for those purposes. Now we're not monitoring this from you. This is a license thing for you to make sure you maintain. But as long as you'll set up AG replicas and not technically use them for any purpose besides checking them, backing them up or monitoring them, you do not pay for the SQL license. And we started this in SQL 19 and we've extended that now into the cloud. And you can do DA and HR drills. If you look at the licensing guide, it says every 90 days, you're allowed to go out there and do a DR drill or an HA drill. So if you wanna fail over and test it out, you're actually allowed to do that. This is a hidden gem that people don't realize is available to them today, on premises or in the cloud. Let me, let me do this, let me get through certain sections and I'll pause for questions, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so that you need to, and I've got some visualizations. Like look at this scenario, this is on premises. I've got a secondary for HA, a secondary for DR. Notice on the right side, I don't pay for those licenses. As long as I'm not using them. They're sitting there waiting for me to be used. Now, that violates the first thing I told you about why people use AGs, because I get to use them, but it's kind of nice that if I just want to use them for sitting there and waiting for availability for higher, faster RTO, RPO or DR, I don't have to pay for the licenses. And in the cloud, you get an extra one. So you're on premises, you got an HA one, a DR one, and now you want to put one in the cloud for DR as well. Notice you don't pay for the licenses as well. Now you're going to pay for compute and storage up there, but not the SQL license. So kind of a nice hidden gem. Let's go ahead and go with your, who had a, you had a question. You can ask a horrible question. So right here, if you see this, it says on premises, that applies to any cloud. Yeah. 
<clears throat> because it's not Azure. In fact, if you look at the license, it says not Azure. So yeah, good question. <laughs> okay, let's talk about, oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. 90 days. 90, you can do any of those. Yeah, there's no, here's one of these things, right? It's not like Microsoft monitoring you, right? But we are saying like, look, you need to adhere to the license guide. But yeah, it could be any one of these things you do in 90 days. Because we want to, I mean, that's silly for not allowing you to do like a drill to make sure this all works properly, right? Yeah, one more question. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, if you're doing a rolling upgrade, obviously when you do a rolling upgrade, you're going to start using it. So at that time when you do the upgrade, you're using it at that point. So that doesn't count as part of this HADR drill scenario. Now, if you go back, then you wouldn't pay for it anymore when it's passive again. But during that period you're doing the upgrade, yes, you'd be paying for the license. <laughs> Does that help a little bit on licensing, though? I mean, like when I sat down and thought about doing a technical talk, I'm like, should I even put this in here? But I think people want to know, you know, this is all possible, right? <laughs> Let's talk about how it works. <clears throat> I'm an architecture guy. I just love doing these kind of things. I'm already busting a, busting a myth right now. Cluster type equals none. You can only do a manual failover, and it works on Linux architectures. So you got an AG, you got a replica in a VM. You set up a secondary sync, you get one primary, up to eight secondaries, five can be sync. We're gonna talk about how that could be an issue for you if you go to multiple sync secondaries. I can do a planned failover, notice here, not automatic failover. I can have a role as read only, I can have a role as no connections, it's synchronous. I can also do an async, which is allow data loss, which means it's a forced operation. And by the way, when we say forced allow data loss, it doesn't mean you're gonna lose data. If they're synced, then you wouldn't lose it, but we don't know that. So we need to know that if you set up as async, you must decide, hey, I'm gonna make this force failover. I'm gonna take the risk that it's possible to have data loss. But we'll show in the demo how you can maybe check and see, am I synchronized? <clears throat> I've already busted a myth. You don't need a cluster to do an AG. You're like, Bob, why would I wanna do that? Well, check this out. I could do that. I could say, oh, I've got an AG on Windows and I wanna go put my replicas on Linux and Windows. That's because the bottom core of the AG architecture back from database mirroring did not rely on clustering. Now out of the gate, we did require a cluster, but in SQL 17, because Linux came along, we built this model. Why would I wanna do such a thing? Does anybody know why you would wanna build this architecture? Yeah, go ahead. You could avoid uh, cluster type licenses, right? Well, Linux would avoid your Windows license, but what if I didn't even, what if I didn't need failover? What if you just wanted a synchronization system? Like I just want to have logs shipped more frequently, log blocks to these replicas and read from them or use them. And I'll decide if I can fail over or not. And as it turns out, you'll find out near the very end of the session, I can use this design for this manage link feature with a distributed availability group. Um, okay, so notice here though, that the whole idea is, I set this up, it's cluster type equals none, but I'm responsible for the failover. When I do AG demos, Without showing failover, I just do this. It's not hard to set up. You can do it with certificates to get uh, security between the nodes. Let's put clustering in the model now. I'm gonna use Windows failover clustering. All of a sudden now it gets a little more interesting because now you have a sync which can do auto failover or plan failover. And you can have an async uh, secondary as well. And you're gonna use something called quorum, as you may know, with Windows failover clustering, to make decisions on when to failover and who to failover to. That's cluster type equals WSFC. And it's automatic or manual. And you're like, wait a minute, I thought it's only automatic. No, no, you could decide yourself to do a manual failover here. And if the sync is synchronized, you're not gonna lose any data. That's up to you to make that decision to do that. Now also notice here that it says you don't need a domain. Did you know that? Did you know back in SQL 16, Windows offered this idea of being able to do a cluster without a domain, with like work groups. There's some things you gotta make to make sure that's synchronized, but sometimes I've built actual cluster systems with SQL Server without domain controllers. There's other reasons why you may not wanna do that, but it's actually possible to do that. So this is the typical scenario of building a failover solution with availability groups. So I've already busted a myth. You don't need a cluster, but you can, and you would do it if you want failover type capabilities. And we're deeply integrated with the Windows failover cluster system. But you're a Linux person. Uh, well, first of all, sorry, you wanna put networks on this, right? You might do a multi-sub-network system and put a listener on it. 
You need to do a listener, right? Because you need an abstraction to go connect to this stuff. I don't want to have to go connect to each node. I connect to a single point called a listener, and I'm redirected to the proper secondary or primary when I'm needed. And if you're a Linux person, you can do cluster type equals external. So Linux systems offer failover systems, if you didn't know that or not. Several partners we work with do that. You could use open source with Pacemaker, with Red Hat Linux, DH2i, HP Service Guard. Several partners offer the ability to provide the failover logic. Now what happens is, no serious, when we, when we talk a little bit about failover, we've built resource DLL-like software to integrate with those partners on Linux. So if you're worried like, how is the actual Linux stuff gonna integrate with Microsoft SQL failover detection, we've got that figured out. So these are two typical architectures you might go build, right? One without a cluster, one with a cluster. <clears throat> now let's dive deeper into the instance. Let's have a little more fun here. Notice this statement. You should think carefully how many of these you put on these instances. Why? Look at a primary. You've got a transaction. You've got a transaction log, no problem. You have multiple log writers. We do that for performance reasons. Those are the ones going to harden to the log. But look at over here, Hader, Hader worker pool and broker workers at a mirroring endpoint. And then you go over here and you have a secondary, which also has a worker pool and has redo workers and Hader workers and multiple log writers. And the log writers on each side are responsible for hardening the log for you. So you're like, okay, what's the big deal? Well, look at this. We have shared workers across these in these instances, but you have dedicated workers per database per replica. Hence this craziness where people say, Bob, can I put 500 databases on an AG, on an instance? I'm like, sure. The docs say, we've tested 100. What if you have 500 of these workers out there now? And your max workers pool is set to a number where that gets to be like 30 left for your workload. So what we do is we never go beyond max workers of your system minus 40 for this system. If you go to these crazy numbers and your max workers are a certain number, like say, I don't know, five or 600 based on the configuration of your server, you don't have a lot left to do your workload. And these will start not being able to do per database per replica. We'll have to trim it down so they're less efficient. And you're like, well, no problem. I'll just bump up max worker threads. Do you have the cores to support that? So when everybody gets in discussion with me about workers and databases, my first question out of the gate is, do you have the number of cores to support this? Where is your app running? And is the workers per core going to support the entire application scenario? So now it gets crazy. Like, Bob, you're showing a really nut stuff now. This is kind of like the flow that's going on between a primary and a secondary. And you're asking yourself, like, what are all those points there? And what are all those boxes? The main message here is that it's a cooperation between user transactions, the log writer thread, and these worker pools and broker tasks. If you didn't know behind the scenes under the covers, we're using service broker ourselves that we wrote under the covers to send messages and log blocks. Yes, we use the broker system we wrote way back in 2005 under the covers to transmit data between these systems, both log blocks and messaging about how to synchronize and coordinate. The cool thing about this story is you see all those white boxes. If you wanted to detail trace every aspect of the system, those are extended events. You could chain this together if you wanted to at a deep level to see exactly the flow, how things are going and the duration of each piece behind the scenes. Which tells you out of the gate, if you wanted to, you could really get deep in debugging of this if you started running the synchronization problems or performance problems. But let's have some fun. Let's go do some debugging. So first of all, I'm just showing you here the layout of what I've done with my AG. Yes, I get to pick the names of these things based on the World Series champions. Yes. No booze in the audience from Astros or Diamondback fans. Sorry. So here I've got a primary replica and I've got a secondary that's synced. And I'm going to have a secondary that's async because I'm going to show you kind of some of the properties of how this works. I've also built a listener. And in this particular case, I only have one availability database that actually is going to go with this. And if you look over here, I'm just using some of the common catalog views to give you a sense. How did I build this thing? Some are synchronous commit. And you see the bottom one is asynchronous commit because that's the async replica. Notice the failover mode is showing you that for the first two, the primary and secondary, I can do automatic failover. I'm eligible to do that. But for the third one, there's only way to do it is a manual failover. We're going to talk about session timeout later during synchronization, but you can see that property. And that's going to be the amount of time that we detect have we lost connection with the secondary. 
Okay, that's lovely, but then how does this thing work a little more internally? So here I've just got a simple query I'm gonna run to run an insert against my table, and I wanna see the impact of the different workers. So if I scroll down here, here's a typical query I use to kind of synchronize like, or, or eliminate and filter what are the workers involved with availability groups. First of all, you see these broker tasks. These are all background tasks. Notice in some cases, the scheduler ID is this huge number. Those are called hidden schedulers to help make worker thread processing more efficient. But scroll down further here. Notice I've got some of these things called, well, first of all, here's log writer. That's the one hardening the log. You'll find that interesting because that's a very big task on the secondary. And if that gets slowed down, it's going to slow down performance for everything. So notice these DMVs. If you ever go look at these DMVs, the number of threads here are only the dynamic threads, not the dedicated ones. So what you're going to find if you pull these is you're going to see these fluctuate. Like if you run this insert and you go back and don't have any activity for a few minutes, you'll see no threads in the system. So if you're ever looking at these threads and thinking that's that total number minus 40, it's not. It's only the dynamic ones we spawn up to do activity to capture log traffic. Okay, so let's go over here now and look at the secondary. Notice the secondary, there's no capture threads listed, but there are redo threads. Why are there redo threads listed? Because of the fact that on the secondary, what are we doing? We're capturing hardened log blocks, but we're also doing redo activity to roll forward continuously as much as possible transactions on the system. And you can look down and see these parallel redo tasks. That's something we do for efficiency to make things faster on the secondary. But notice here are some of these hater work threads. Now, why am I showing you this stuff? Because I want you to see what it looks like on a normal system. If you're an AG system, you've not seen this before. You're like, what is all this stuff? This is the background of how we're processing things. I'm going to show you in a second what it looks like to have like 300 of these databases. So let me get a little bit more look about the sequence that we talked about. I took the X events in that diagram and I created a session for it. I just created and listed them all out. And if you go look at these things, you can look at some of these session IDs and you can see the sequence of how things are processing. Now, would you ever do this normally? No. But if you start having problems, you would go maybe use some of these sessions to actually go to the system and see what is the duration of each sequence going on. Because it's a cooperation of your transaction that's starting the transaction itself and some of these worker threads. Notice that log writer is the one that it goes back to this X event data. That's the one doing the flush because that's the separate log writer that's doing commits for your transactions. And it's responsible for making sure that you have like a write log wait that may show up, right? And if you look down a little further, notice these capture log block workers. You look at here and you can scroll down and see, well, what does one of those look like? Well, it's one of these capture log wait types. So if you see these wait types show up, that's not bad. That's just a normal system capturing changes in your primary, getting ready to submit things to the secondary. Now let's do some debugging. Let's go look at a call stack, what this looks like. I'm just using the SQL call stack resolver tool you can download yourself, and I'm pulling in to see what a call stack looks like. This is a typical call stack for a, work, a hater worker. This is what it looks like. Behind the scenes, these workers are just on a queue waiting for work to do. And the biggest thing that they do is they look for changes. They're looking for log changes to be captured, and they're going to go process these things and put them and send them across to the secondary. Now, these capture log block events have modes. Part of it is to capture, part of it is to send. And if you look at one of the other modes for sending, it's a broker task. So now you see the cooperation between a thread that's capturing the change and putting it on for a broker task to do the messaging. It's an abstraction of our code. We want one piece of code to sit there and just process messages inside the actual always on available group system. We want set up some, one set of threads that know how to do broker transmission between the systems, back to our diagram. <clears throat> so if I look at the call stack here, I can see I've actually got a broker call stack. You're not gonna normally go through these call stacks, but it's kind of fun to go look behind the scenes and say, what are these things doing? How are they cooperating and working between? And again, if you had just tons of databases, you can see maybe the problem here that some of these things may not be doing anything, but they're still taking up worker threads on your system. This is what a secondary looks like. So based on doing that transaction, it's going to look a little different on the X event side. There's going to be less events to actually look, to look at. So going through here, you can see I'm going to run this transaction, and I'm going to go through and actually look and see what it looks like. <clears throat> so notice there are less events. Like, Bob, why are there less events here, right? Because on the secondary, I'm just receiving things and hardening them and redoing them. There's not as much activity that's required on a secondary. 
So if you're wondering like, okay, so does the number of databases matter for secondaries? It's less of an impact, but it's still a potential impact. Why is that? Because for synchronized replicas, the rate at which we can harden the log on the secondary dictates performance of the primary. And we're gonna see that during data synchronization here uh, in a different demonstration. So I'm just showing you the different tasks, like here's the log writer tasking our secondary, that's responsible for hardening the log down in that secondary replica. So it's possible for you to go debug these things and kind of see what's going on from their processing. This is what it looks like to have 300 databases on a primary. I said, jack it up. Let's just go put 300 databases on there. Now I want you to scroll in and see what these threads look like. So if you go look at the, even just the dynamic threads that are spawned up by doing inserts, check that out. It's like 400 threads there. And by the way, on this system, I only have max worker threads at zero which for the number of cores I have is like 576. Can you see the problem? What if you put a massive workload in the system? What would be your behavior? You get like thread pool weights. You start getting timeouts from your application and queries because we can't get rid of these things. We have dedicated and shared, but we're not gonna trim this down too far because we can't process availability groups if we do that. We're not gonna sacrifice processing availability groups for your system, for your app, just because you got a big workload coming in because you made the decision to put that many databases in a replica. This is why you gotta be careful to go to something of that level. Okay, so you gotta feel for, if you got into a system, what are the, what the different threads look like? Uh, what are the different X events I could do to trace the system? And what could I see differently in the system? So I'm looking over here now and showing you, look at all the different threads, the worker threads with that capture weight on there. This is what it looks like to have that many databases on a system. Okay. Any questions a little bit about that? Like, how does that work? Number of threads, have you run into this scenario before? Yeah, way in the back. Can you speak up a little bit? I can barely hear you. How many what? Yeah, it's per replica per database. So yes, the number of AG, it's, it's, so think about in terms of I've got an AG and I've got, which is a replica, and I've got, which is like primary, and I've got a database. If I had five AGs, one with each database, it would be no different than having one AG with five databases, if that's kind of what you're asking. But it's really the database unit that matters is per replica. But know this, it's, that there's some dedicated that we can never get rid of, and there's some dynamically that spawn back and forth. Yeah. We'll talk about that near the end. Yeah, we'll talk about that near the end of the session, about Azure a little bit. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about data synchronization. So the first time anybody asked me about a problem with data synchronization, the first time they asked me about that, I asked this question, do you need to synchronize? And they're like, what do you mean? Of course I do. Doesn't everybody do that? And I'm like, no, I'm really being serious. Like, do you need a synchronous system for automatic failover purposes? And literally they go like, you know, I've never really thought about that before. Like, maybe I really don't. Like, maybe I'm really just doing this to asynchronously get my changes on a secondary so I can just look at those changes. So anytime you start talking about data synchronization performance, always think in your mind, do I need to actually do this? If you need auto failover, then absolutely you gotta go do this. I'm sorry? Well, of course it depends, but I'm saying, that's why I always ask the question. Like when somebody says I have sync performance problems, they're like, well, do you need to do that? Now, again, the answer could be, I need auto failover. Well, you gotta do it, right? What I'm gonna show you in a second here is something you may not know. And that is, we're not gonna penalize primary transactions for the, safe, for the sakeness of being synchronized. You're like, what do you mean by that? We'll show you. Okay, so this diagram here is kind of a more higher level view of that crazy thing I just showed you with the sequences of how we do things. Flush the log in the primary, capture the changes, send it to the secondary, flush it on the secondary, and redo it on the secondary. If you have a sync replica, we wait for number five. See number five there? On the primary, we wait for that. And we wait until a session timeout. But then if it times out, we keep going. Huh? We'll show you in a second what I mean. If it's async, we don't wait for number five. That's as simple as it gets. So the, fat, the, way, the, the, the performance of flushing logs on a secondary is critical to primary performance. Obviously flushing logs on the primary is, but what I've seen customers do is set up a sync secondary and the performance of the sync secondary isn't even close to being 
from an IO perspective and a compute perspective to the primary. And when you underpower your sync secondary, you are also causing problems on your primary just by doing that alone, because we need both of these operations to harden to do a synchronous operation. But again, if, we're gonna, if we time out, we're not gonna wait. What do I mean by that? <clears throat> so, you may have seen these wait types before, write log and hater sync commit. When we have a sync secondary and we pull blocks to the secondary and things are synchronized, you will see both wait types for a single session. Huh? That's because when we send a transaction to a secondary, we asynchronously are hardened the primary. We do it parallel. But the primary transaction doesn't complete until both of them have finished. This is why you can see both wait types. That's not a bad scenario, that's normal. What if the secondary though is not reachable? There's something called a session timeout, 10 seconds. If it takes longer than 10 seconds, guess what happens? We go into what's called the not synchronizing state. Maybe you've seen that before. But guess what happens to the primary? We just keep going. So what happens now though? I can't auto failover, but the primary can keep going. So again, we sacrifice, we don't gonna, we're not gonna sacrifice failover needs for keeping your primary going. This almost looks like an async secondary now, right? We'll kind of flip modes here if a timeout occurs and says, hey, we're gonna keep going to the primary while the secondary maybe comes back up. Let's say it tries to come back up. What it's gonna look like now is this, synchronizing. So secondary is trying to catch up. The write logs are still happening when this occurs. But if we think it's too far ahead, we do that. So if your secondaries get way behind, we might throttle you in the primary to make sure it can catch up enough. So again, we don't sacrifice failover, but after a certain point, we are, to make sure the secondary can get synchronized at some point. And when the secondary gets synchronized, you go back to that mode. So here's a myth. That isn't bad. <laughs> that weight type is not bad. I've heard people say, hater sync commit, bad weight type. It is a bad weight type if it takes forever to do it on the secondary, but the existence alone is normal for an availability group. So let's put a twist on this scenario. What if I've got two of them? Notice here that the hater sync commit is a sum of both weights. That may be something you didn't know. So the multiple second, the more secondaries I add, the longer the commit time for hater sync commit becomes because I must wait for each secondary to harden before the primary can continue. Notice the blue box. You asked about the cloud. One thing we do different. In Azure PaaS, we don't use Windows failover clustering. We have our own system with the service fabric. And we figured out a way to make sure only one has to synchronize to make this happen. As one as one synchronized, we can fail over. That's all we care about. So in the box, though, with SQL Server, uh, we most, both must commit. Now, what if one of them gets cut? Notice it goes back to only one. You only have to wait for one of these things, and we can fail over if they're synchronized. So if you've got multiple sync secondaries, I understand why you're gonna do this. It's a protection mechanism for these kind of type scenarios. But realize what's happening. I've had customers put up multiple sync secondaries, and they powered one of them and underpowered the second one. And all of a sudden they got slow. Because the second one is slower and holding up the entire process. Yeah. <clears throat> it's, a good, it's a good chance for me to drink, take a drink. <laughs> It's a plus. So that's the sum of these two. It's not a serialize, it's just the addition of both. So it's not like we wait one for the other, I'm just saying the wait time is the combination of the wait for one and the wait for the other. So let's, let's say that it took one millisecond to wait, let, let me just, if it take one millisecond to wait for the first one, and it takes one millisecond to wait for the second one, it's two milliseconds total to wait. We're doing it in parallel, don't get me wrong. It could be they're so fast that it's not that big of a deal, but make sure you keep in mind that it's the summation of waiting for both that make you wait on the primary. Does that make sense? No? It could be max. You could, if you wanna call it max, that's fine. Uh, you're right, it is max of the two. You're right, if it, it's max of the two. I'll fix the slide. So it's not an accumulation of like one and one means two. If it's one comes back at the same, it's the same, but I promise you with two of them, what I've seen is the second be underpowered and it, it actually ends up being like the sum. Yeah. It's the session timeout that I talked about. This. Yeah. No, 
No, it, you would have to go do that yourself manually. We will use that synchronization throttle. So the question is like, if this thing is so far behind, do we like just forget about it? No, we don't. You have to yourself take that offline. We're gonna try to let that thing synchronize and catch up. So you, in those scenarios where it's way behind, maybe you wanna take it offline first, reseed it, whatever you wanna do, right? So yeah, that's fair, actually chain it. It's a max, you're absolutely correct on that. Um, and, but notice you can still fail over if it's synchronized. So if the first one's synchronized, you can do that. Yeah. I'm sorry? Well, if you look over here, <clears throat> if you look back here, <clears throat> excuse me, um, this is a 10 second timeout, which means we will not go to this mode, whoops. This is the impact. When this occurs, we're gonna wait for 10 seconds to, to recognize that. You know what I'm saying? So we'll hold up things, which is why you can change the session timeout if you want to. That's a configurable option. But yeah, we're gonna wait for 10 seconds to decide, can we keep going and see that it's not around? But also keep in mind this, for a secondary that's behind, but it's not cut, it could look like this. And it's fine for a while until we get to this throttle mode, right? Where we decide, oh, and I don't have the numbers from when we make that decision, but if it's behind, it's synchronizing, then if we're behind, we're gonna to go to that throttle mode. And notice when it's in that state, you can't fail over. It's gotta be in the green state. It's always gotta look like that to decide to fail over. Yeah, oh, there was another question, yeah. Yeah, I do, I'm gonna show it in a second. <laughs> okay, one thing I wanna add though that's new that we added in SQL 17 is that. So let's say you did not want us to actually keep going. You need to make sure in this case that both secondaries have hard, but the, the word commit's terrible here. You've, we wanna make sure both secondaries have hardened the log before I allow things to keep going. And if one of them is cut, take the AG actually offline. So that's an option we added, the default zero, which is another behavior I've been describing. But if you wanna go through and say, hey, I gotta make sure at least one secondary is always hardened, we will wait for that. And if it goes offline, we'll take the AG offline. So there is a way to kind of change the behavior I talked about, about not waiting around. And that's the setting to actually go do that. Okay, let's go look at the demo. <clears throat> so there's a nifty way to do this without cutting the cord or network or something. I'm gonna go add some transactions and I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna look at, and I've got write log weights going on. And I wanna go see what does a hater sub commit look like? So you see write log, write log, write log. Then all of a sudden now you're gonna see a hater sync commit show up. This is how both wait types can appear for the same request in these DMVs. If you use X event, you can see the actual sequence of these. Now things look great, but notice here that things look synchronized, it's fine. And if I go and I can go look at DMVs to say, hey, let me go see what the LSNs look like. So if you wanted to know, can I manually fail over and be synchronized even for an async replica, you can look at these particular DMVs and see, are they synchronized? Are they hard and the same? So again, it may not appear that they are, but these values could help you make some of those decisions to do that. So let's go have fun here. And one easy way that I love what we put actually into the system is we can actually go suspend data movement. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna tell the system, don't send changes to the secondary anymore. Almost like I'm cutting the cord, like I've just did the session timeout. And all of a sudden you see in the dashboard, things look bad and in the case that it's not synchronizing. And what does that mean? I can't fail over. So what does it look like down at like the DMV level? So let's look at the waiting requests. <clears throat> you can go over here and go run a transaction and see now that the weights will show up as only write log. I have no hater sync commit weights because I'm not waiting on the secondary. <clears throat> but <clears throat> I wanna go see actually <clears throat> what the ramifications are for the system in terms of the AG health. So I can go over here, <clears throat> excuse me, I can go over here and look at uh, do I see, like one thing I look at the dashboard is this estimated data loss. So we're trying to calculate, based on these changes we're seeing, how much data would you potentially lose in terms of time to the actual secondary? And the DMVs give you more information about the LSN. So I can see here, here's a not healthy state, here's the synchroni not synchronizing state from my diagram. And if I look over to the right, I can see information about the LSNs being way off. Can you, the, the, the bottom row is the primary. See how far the number is ahead of the secondaries? So I know now that if I try to do a failover manually, I absolutely would lose data. There's no way to actually get it back. And in fact, I think what I have in the demo here, so I try to go in and do like a manual failover. Now, one other thing I wanna point out, notice down here, if you tried to go truncate the log, you can't. It's full recovery. 
we can't get rid of those log records to truncate it because we haven't shipped them to the secondary. So in this case, when we're not synchronizing, you have a log truncation problem still going on. So when you talked about getting way behind, you may need to cut the cord there because all of a sudden you can't truncate your log in the primary. So even though we're not waiting for the secondary, we don't want to truncate those transactions because how do we ever get the secondary synchronized if we don't do that? Okay, so let's go here and I think we're gonna go resume the data movement and see, you want to see about this partial healthy state and this synchronizing throttle, this is what it looks like. So here we go, partially healthy because the secondary is trying to catch up to the primary. Now, again, we're gonna do right log weights. We're not gonna do hater sync commit weights because we're starting to get the secondary caught up. But you're gonna see I'm gonna pump so many transactions in this system that I get that synchronizing throttle weight showing up. So the, the nut of this is we're not gonna wait for that secondary, but the secondary gets way behind, you are gonna potentially have primary weights going on because we're gonna eventually throttle you and say, we gotta let this guy catch up because you intended for that to be synchronized. And eventually you can look at these LSNs and you can find out the fact that, yeah, it looks like it's kind of catching up. In this particular case, it catches up pretty quick. I can even truncate the transaction log. I go back to my dashboard, things look healthy. So we kind of kind of see a little bit of a demo. You yourself can go test this out, obviously not in production, by resuming and doing suspend. Or you can try to just go connect, uh, cut the connection to the secondary. Yeah. Yeah, there's a question he asked earlier, like, there's a point where we get too far behind. We don't do that, though. Like, if we get too far behind, we'll never say, just forget about it. Um, we, that's up to you. You would have to go, like, say, take this AG, take the secondary out of the AG. Um, so you yourself could see how far, but if you see your primary getting that uh, impacted by this, you probably would want to take that secondary offline, right? Let the primary continue, then bring it back on later. But remember, when you bring it back online, if it's just using log changes, that's a long time to get synchronized. You may need to reseed it in that particular case. Sorry, other questions? So we... <clears throat> if, you, if you start and add the secondary back or turn it back on, it will start replaying the logs. That's why we can't truncate the log. No, you cannot do it offline. You have to reseed at that point. You reseed the database, yeah. You can take it, you can put it back to the G, but you need to recede at that point. Otherwise, you're just going to start catching up again. You can't, you can't replay the log. You can't go say, let's go restore the logs or something of that nature. You need to recede the database at that point. Okay, so that's synchronization. Let's talk about performance. One of the things I love about AGs, remember that diagram again, is that for all those sequences, you have perfmon counters for every single piece. So if you're kind of trying to measure performance between all these pieces together, you can actually do that. And even further, you're gonna go crazy on this. There are X events for everything I showed in that diagram. You could combine X events with Perfmon to get a very detailed granular look at every part of this system, especially when we start having issues. So a couple things. Number one, redo performance. I've heard this stated before, it's not true. Redo performance does not affect sync performance, but time to recover after failover. Does that make sense? Because remember, all we were waiting is for number five right there, not for the redo part. So if redo gets behind, you're not gonna affect sync performance, but the time it takes to fail over on the secondary and get the database up is affected. And large parallel index builds will slow you down. And there's really no great solution around it, unfortunately, except number one, don't do parallel index builds if you can. And two, do them chunks or do them offline or do reorgs. That's because these are massive log transactions that have to be shipped to the secondary. And that's gonna bottleneck everything else you're sending for your transactions. This is something that has plagued us since the dawn of time, and I don't know how to solve it yet. And even in the cloud, this is an issue. So yeah, this is an issue. Now, if I don't get to this, I wanna make sure I state, definitely in the secondary, enable something called accelerated database recovery, which we started in 2019 and now in 2022. Why? That speeds up undo performance on the secondary. Because when we do recover, we have to do both redo and undo. And if you have active transactions, when you do a failover, which is possible, you want that undo to be fast. Okay, here is an interesting demo. Does a secondary affect replica performance, like a workload? So I'm using some perfmon counters here. Bat sent to replica, transactions per second on the primary, and some ones you haven't seen before. What is the delay of transactions? And how many transactions are we mirroring to the secondary? What does that rate look like? <clears throat> and I'm gonna go over here, and I'm going to run that workload. 
Of course we are the champions. I just loved running these demos over and over that we're the champions. So notice these are massively large rows, 5,000 characters per row. And you know, you don't know if this looks good or not. You just know like this looks like the rate on my system. It's not a, it's not a sign in this demo to say, oh, that's a great set of numbers. What I wanna show you is that on a secondary, if I run a massive CPU workload, what happens to the primary? So notice here, hater sync commit weights are kinda of look like a certain number. That doesn't look bad probably in our system, it could be okay. But what does it look like if we do something on the secondary? So let's go over the secondary here. Now let's add a couple things on the secondary. Let's see how fast we're getting bytes from the primary and how fast are we flushing the log on the secondary? Remember I told you about number five? So I wanna go run a crazy workload. I'm gonna go run a bunch of threads doing read replica queries at 100% in parallel. I don't wanna see what happens. So let's go over back over to our primary and see what it looks like and watch this graph tank. Wow. And you're like, what? All I'm doing is run a read workload over there. Why is my flushes, uh, why are my flushes being affected? Why is everything being affected? It's like the, the log should be flushed in the primary just as well as the, the secondary. Like, I don't understand what's going on. So let's go back over the secondary and see what it looks like. So I go to the secondary and I'm like, okay, what does the log flush look like on this? Well, first of all, here's the hater so you can commit weights. Way high now. Because I'm waiting for the secondary to send me stuff before I say everything's able to go forward. Now here, oh my gosh, look at this. So what's happening is there's so much CPU pressure on your secondary from these read workloads. Even though the log writer's on hidden scheduler, it can't enough CPU cycles to run. This is not an IO problem. This is actually a workload problem on your secondary. And the moral of this message is, be careful what you run on your secondary. Because <laughs> I've had customers go, they love the fact that you read workloads there, but then they go take some system that's underpowered, or they run huge CPU workloads that affect the ability for us to process log hardens on a secondary, which affects the ability to do your transactions on the primary. The whole system comes to a grind. You see, that, that's, see I, can't, I can't send as many because I'm not receiving as many. I can't receive as many because I'm sending as many. The whole thing is just a chain reaction, and it's all due to what you did on a secondary replica. You guys see how that could be an issue? You're gonna need to go check that kind of type of situation. So when you see a primary performance, you need to do the right method here. If I go back to my slide deck here, you need to spend time doing this. Let me go see what it looks like from an overall picture. But don't be afraid and don't, 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 what I'm saying is make sure you go look at like a secondary system and don't just look at the IO of the secondary system, which is a big effect here. But it could be something like a read workload that affects deeply your situation. Okay, so in 2016, I remember being an engineering team, Lindsay Allen, who now works in, in AI space, was in our product team. And I was in building 16 one day, which is where we used to be on campus building 16. And I walked over and she says, Bob, did you know what we did in 2016 to speed up availability groups? And I'm like, no, I, I don't know what we did. She goes, we turbocharged it. And I'm like, ah, Bob Ward, blog post. So I thought to myself, I'm gonna go throughout the building and talk to the developers. I'm like, what did they do to turbocharge 2016? Because prior to 2016, we were having customers that were actually having issues with running primary workloads during availability groups and affecting the overall process. So what happened is the team went through a series of improvements to reduce the number of worker thread connections, the number of pieces together to make this work in that diagram, multiple log riders, parallel redo, and you can see the chart to the right. So provided I had a secondary that was powered just as much of a primary, the yellow bar down there represents 2014. And in 16, look at the bar at the top. So I built this blog post, you can go read it today, called Always on Turbocharge. And the whole idea was to prove to you that with the right amount of horsepower on your secondary, and the right amount of making sure you don't affect the secondary with a massive thing like I just did, it is possible to achieve pretty decent performance on an always on primary replica availability group. Notice the top here, that with a OTP type workload, we achieved 95% of a standalone instance with a sync replica. So if you're out there saying like, you know, that I can't put AGs in my system with a primary, because it's just gonna tank down my primary workload, it is possible to actually go do that. But the message that I tried to put in the blog was not all just fun charts and stuff, is do not underpower your secondary for a sync replica. For asyncs, it doesn't matter. 
put it, put it on a very inexpensive system because it, that's up to you and how much data you want to be synchronized there. But for sync replicas, it's critical. It'd be a very high powered system, which is why in the cloud, we talked, you're talking about the cloud, for a business critical service tier, they're exactly the same. Those nodes that run a business critical service tier for those replicas are the exact same powered VMs and nodes. Okay, let's talk about failover. Let's have some fun here. Here's a couple of myths. Failover only occurs of a hardware OS problem, and failover detection is only at the instance level. Now, it normally is at the instance level, but it doesn't have to be. So here's Bob's auto failover revealed slide. In the clustering system, we have the Windows clustering resource, something called a resource monitor. We wrote a DLL called the resource DLL. Now, we've had that around for a while in failover cluster technology, but we enhanced it for availability groups. And here's how we did it. So look over to the right is your SQL server. So first of all, what we added was the ability to, do, to call a stored procedure called SB server diagnostics. That stored procedure is built into the engine. Let's go look at the health of SQL server. And along with it is something called a health check timeout. It's like 30 seconds. So there are two things about this stored procedure. If you can't run the procedure, the health check timeout expires, we're gonna do a failover. And we call that is alive to the cluster manager. Or that procedure could return an error based on something called a flexible failover policy, which you control. So in other words, now we can go look at the health of SQL Server, not just the overall system and say, hey, we maybe we should do a failover based on this. Notice the health check timeout is actually configurable. Second of all, we wanted to support something called a lease timeout, which you may have heard before, with something called looks alive in the cluster manager. Why do we need that? Well, it could be that SQL's kind of running okay, maybe, but there's actually a priority preemptive thread running in the engine that is gonna tell us, hey, and it's 20 seconds, that I'm gonna talk to what's called a shared memory on the system itself, and I'm not gonna rely on a query. So notice there's like two levels of protection here for failover. One is based on a query sent to the engine, and, and a fairly sophisticated one, but, than years before. The second one's based on more of a coordination between threads that's not a query. And notice that that least thread in SQL, it runs in preemptive mode, so it's not affected by other types of workers, and it runs at a high priority within the system itself. So for high CPU problems, the system still could actually behave correctly. Because what happens is the resource DLL and the least thread are talking to each other all the time. They're doing something called the lease negotiation to make sure things are healthy. And if that timeout exceeds where they're not, that's going to end up doing what? It's called a failover. So the resource DLL coordinates with SQL Server and the cluster manager to make failover decisions. Now notice when a failover occurs, what we do. When a failover is going to happen, we take the primary offline to avoid something called a split brain problem. If we did not do that, you could actually have two, prim two replicas that think they're both primaries. That's called that famous split brain issue. So that's kind of the mechanics behind we do failover, and, and I've just kind of proven to you that the fact that it's not just an OS issue or a server issue, and the fact there's another option called a database health detection. That's optional. We added that in 2016. So if a database comes corrupt or goes offline in your AG, we can also issue a failover independent of this. Now remember this though, AGs are made up of what? what what's, what's inside a replica? What's an containment in a replica? A database, right? But you can have more than one. So if one of the databases goes bad in that AG, we will do a failover. And notice here that most of these checks are to instance level, so no matter what the health of all those databases are, if that option's not set, we're doing a failover. Notice these are the ways you can configure things. Configure the policy to decide this is something called a level. You can change these timeout values. Now here's some scenarios. But before I say that, here's something very important. And this is a beautiful thing we added for failover diagnostics. <clears throat> You've seen X event before in the system. So we know how to write an X event file in the SQL Server team. We know the format of it. So in the resource DLL, since we're calling this SP Server Diagnostics, we write a separate X event file outside the engine called the SQL Diag X event file. We'll show what it looks like in a second. So you can do independent analysis of a failover, even if the engine is down, of what happened from this resource DLL perspective. Here's some scenarios that you might run into and the different things that kick in because of it. Notice here that some are lease timeout scenarios, some are health check timeout scenarios, and one's even a health check failure. Here's a couple of tips. I would use the default policy, even though there are more granular policies. Do you know why? 
I tried for one week to break SQL Server <laughs> to cause those uh, detail levels to kick in, and I couldn't do it. Like, I would kick in level three every time I tried to do something. In fact, the demo I'm going to show you, I kicked in level three. So I don't see a need for you to use those more advanced options. You can take a look at four and five. They're very detailed options. Maybe it's something you want to look at, but I'm not sure it's something you need to actually do. The secondary replica for a failover is chosen on the order it's added. So if you go in and say, hey, I'm going to add three replicas, which one does it choose to failover first if, say, all three are available? It's the order they're added, not some other typical order. And then finally, make sure this is, you, this is very important. When you do a, a failover, an auto failover occurs, we still have to do redo and undo. So if you're expecting, oh, I'm going to failover, this thing is going to be up in two seconds. If redo's behind, that's not true. If it's a lot of undo to do, that's not true, which is why using ADR could be critical for your environment to make sure that the undo processing we do failover is super fast. And by the way, in the cloud, in past services, we turn ADR on and we, can't, we don't let you turn it off. We don't let you configure it because we have an SLA to maintain in the actual cloud. Okay, let's go have some fun with failovers. So this is what a manual failover looks like, and I'm using the always on health session to do it. So that's one piece of a diagnostic thing for you right now. You have something called the always on health X event session in the engine, and you can go see what are the sequence of events that have occurred that maybe a failover happened. In this case, I'm just doing a manual one. I'm doing an alter server statement. I'm gonna go through the process of seeing role changes. Okay, I'm doing manual failover, so now a failover is gonna go between a primary and secondary. And if you're wondering like, well, what does it look like inside the engine to do that? You can see this coordination happening here between the resource DLL and the engine. So looking at this call stack, and this is the actual alter server command, we actually see this thing called hater proxy signal, hater controller. We behind the scenes are actually sending a signal to the resource DLL saying, hey, I think you should go engine a failover here. So SQL server in the engine doesn't do it, and it shouldn't do that, right? It needs to be coordinated with the cluster manager. So because we have this coordination with them, the signaling ability, we can say, hey, you guys go signal this resource failover event. So I just do a manual failover. That's what it looks like. So I thought to myself, how about to trigger an actual real failover? You know, take away a disk or, you know, something kind of interesting. No, no, no. Let's have more fun. Let's be stupid. Let's go set max server memory to 512 on the system, 512 meg, and see SQL cripple. So all I did is just set it to 512. Instantaneously when I do this, Watch this happen. Now I'm gonna use the listener below so I can stay connected here. I'm gonna run this command and use the reconfigure. And within like seconds, this gets really fun. So I'm see here looking at the dashboard. I'm like, okay, this looks fine. It's no big deal, right? Everything looks healthy. And then very quickly things fall apart very badly. And that's because I've squeezed down SQL server memory so bad that even the worker threads can't allocate memory for hater. So things look terrible here. And I'm trying to go figure out like, okay, this has happened now. I didn't, let's say I didn't, I didn't know I set memory like that. Okay, so I set this kind of weird thing, but this failover occurs. I don't know why, let's see if we can go figure it out. So I'm gonna go in here, I'm gonna go look, let's go look at some diagnostics. So I, here, I, I still can check to my listener, right? I'm using my listener because a failover actually happened at this point to VM2. So if I use the listener, I can always go take a look at the information. So I'm gonna go down here and I'm gonna see on the, on the, you can see it's on the secondary side here. I can look and see that my primary now has become my SQL VM2, which used to be the secondary. But I'll, I can also go here and look at particular type of health information. Because what I'd like to do is kind of do a little bit more of a diagnostic, like this wasn't a manual failover. This was actually a auto failover, like what happened? So let me go do that. So I'll go over here. And I'm going to go look at the always on. But oh, first of all, just to let you know, if I wanted to do a failover myself at this point, like actually manually failover, what would I do? I can't because nobody's synchronized at this point. So anytime you want to go see, can I be synchronized? Just try the failover wizard. It'll tell you. No, you can't do that in any of these kind of scenarios. So let's go look at always on health and see what it actually looks like. Oh, by the way, I tried to fix the problem by doing a zero. What happened? Do you know why this one doesn't run? I can't allocate memory to connect back into SQL Server to even run a zero. I'll show you how I get out of it in a second. So I'm like, okay, great. So what am I going to do now? I need to go figure out why this is actually failing over. So, uh, and obviously the error log gets crazy here and kind of trying to show me there are problems. In fact, if I type the error log out, you can just see this madness is happening here. We, can't, we don't have enough memory even to print an error log message. So because we've squeezed memory so hard inside the engine for memory that needs, this is a good example of the minimum memory needed just to run something on AG. Certainly it's more than 512 on meg in this case. 
So going into always on, on health session, I can see some interesting information here about what's happening. Uh, I can tell if I start scrolling down some of the different messages I get from this error situation. So I can see, for example, if I look up here, I can see at this particular time, notice here, in an insufficient memory. So even the threads trying to send messages back and forth can't allocate memory to do anything. And if I look further at my health session, I'm going to get information to indicate really what's happening here. So I'm going to scroll down here. Yeah, failed to create a log block message. This is kind of crazy. And then if I look at things like error reported, I'll get some in, in, more information here about what's happening. Let me scroll down and look at that. Okay, let me jump over here. So I was looking at, so I, Always on Health can give me some great information. I think that's wonderful. But I think I was telling you guys the ability to go look at this diag from SQL resource. Let's say that I couldn't even get these X event files for some reason because the engine for it is not available. Inside your log file is these SQL diag files. This is not an X event session in the engine. This is us knowing how to write an X event file from our resource DLL. So I can merge these together and get deep diagnostics of what might have happened. So if you look over here, I get info messages about uh, what is the state and health of the system. And if I keep scrolling a little bit further on this, I'm going to add some columns here. Let's add like, what is the information message from these things? And there's something called a state that I'm going to add as well. So if I add a state, I'll look down here. And I'm going to scroll down here and things are look like what's called clean. This is before I actually did the craziness of doing that memory message. So scroll down here. If I go back up here, notice I'm dumping out like ODBC timeout information. Remember, this is a client of the server. So this resource DLL is able to dump out diagnostics as a client to do that connection with SQL and see there's like a timeout going on. And can you see here it says warning? This is because right before this happened, that store procedure ran and knew we were starved of memory. It came back and said, oh, you, you're kind of running low on memory here. It's one of those errors I talked about, but it's not an error state yet. But error got, res got dumped out so quickly that it couldn't come back and connect and run again. So there could be a scenario, by the way, where you're low on memory, but not totally low yet, where that actual diagnostic could come back and give an error and cause a failover to occur before you really ran out of memory. So it is possible to use that flexible failover policy in some scenarios to be very granular about when to failover and when not to failover. So I get more detailed information as well from this. This is just a way to show you how you can offline look at a failover situation. If you've never looked at a cluster log before, that is also very valuable because this is what the Windows clustering system thinks happening in your system. Now, since we're a resource DLL, besides X event, we will print out information in the cluster log as well as part of the participation of we, what we talked about, like the is alive and the health check timeout and the, and the lease timeout. So if you're trying to wonder, like, how do I go see some of the things that the cluster manager thinks is happening? You can use this cluster log and notice we actually put the word SQL Server Availability Group in the cluster log with the word RES. Those are sections you can go look at to see what was the resource DLL telling the cluster manager at the time of the problem. Notice we had this warning state like we saw in the diag file and eventually you can see us, we can't connect to the server and we eventually schedule an actual failover happening. And we report that's an actual is alive timeout or is alive problem happening because we can't do that. Because back when I showed you that diagram, what's happening here is before the lease timeout's kicking in, right? And here's the thing that's interesting. You know that lease worker? It doesn't have any memory it needs to allocate. So the lease worker thinks thing, the, the lease timeout is not being invalidated here. The looks alive is fine. But the query can't be run because they can't get memory. So this is where the health check timeout will come in. It's a good example of us having two layers of protection to decide is SQL Server unhealthy, except for just a service going down or a hardware issue coming on. It's a better detection of the health of the SQL instance. And then if I went back to the error log, I can see, okay, what caused all this madness at the beginning? Well, some idiot named Bob Ward went in and changed memory from 0 to 512. That led to this craziness all stopping here. Obviously, you would never go do that in a production system. Any questions about how I showed you how to use some of the techniques? Always on health file, the diag health file, the X event file, and the cluster log, all to see a combination of what actually happened behind the scenes. Does anybody know how I got out of this? Because I couldn't change it to zero. Anybody want to take a guess? What's that? Dedicated admin cache. Actually, that wouldn't work either. Because it still thinks I've got memory configured at 512. Anybody want to take a shot at that? Anybody done that? Yeah, go ahead. 
Restart single user mode, that's true. What is required to do that though to make this work in your single user mode? Because otherwise you're gonna get locked out. Well, it's already shut down, yeah. Yeah, so you start with single user mode, and there's another option to say only allow SQL command to get in. So then I get in with SQL command, I set it back to zero and restart it. That's how I got out of it. So in case you ever run into that in your production system, there's a tip. You need to use that other option to make sure the app name is only one allowed in, or you're gonna get locked out yourself. So not dedicated admin connection, just single user mode, put in the dash M option, which is your app name, use SQL command for SP configure, and then it'll work from there. You can't use SSMS, by the way, it tries to open too many connections to actually go do that. Okay, let's talk about extending availability groups. I want to make sure I cover and show you this link feature for managed instances at the end. So you or may not have certain um, opinions about these, but you have different allow connection settings for your secondaries. Did you know that you can actually set up your secondaries to not even allow anybody to use them? So like if you wanted to make sure for like this high availability license scenario, I don't want anybody to try to even connect into those things and use them. You can actually have a connection setting to do that. And you have connection intent, as you may know, with your programs and your drivers to say, I want to make sure it's a read-only connection coming in. <clears throat> Read queries on secondary replicas use snapshots by default, if you did not know that. So we use snapshot isolation for you behind the scenes. And though, if you use accelerated database recovery, we will use the versions in the database, not in TempDB to create a version store for those versions. You can do backups on secondaries. If you didn't know, DTC and cross database are supported past 2017. And here is one of the hidden gems of this entire system. Did you know, for a normal AG, that if we detect a page is damaged or corrupted on a primary, if you're running Enterprise Edition, that we can go to the secondary, find a clean page, bring it back to the primary, and do an online auto page repair for you automatically. And we do that in the cloud for you behind the scenes, in some cases, if we detect that. Definitely use multi-subnet failover in your connection string, even if you don't have a multi-subnet. There is a better, faster way to make sure we route you faster to do a failover for your actual primary application if you use that connection string. We have a new feature in SQL 2022, query store on secondary replicas. Yes, I realize it's still under a trace flag. I'm sorry about that. But it still exists, and it's still possible for you to go now do query store and capture queries on secondary replicas. Yeah. I'm sorry? Not yet, because the trace flag is still needed right now. So we're still working on trying to get that in the CU update. Okay, so contained AGs, I want to just briefly mention this. I'm, instead of going to a deep architecture, it is something in 2022 we shipped. And the way this technology works is this. We have a listener, and if you connect to the listener, you are redirected to a different set of databases which represent your system databases. So effectively, and SQL agents been enhanced to do this, so effectively now, when you do a failover to a secondary, if you use the listener to add an agent job, it shows up automatically on the secondary. Why is that? Because these are actual databases to the AG system, so the log changes are shipped to the other secondary. If you connect directly to the instance, it doesn't, it doesn't work this way, you know that it must connect to a listener or direct database context to see this actually happen. SQL agent on a secondary, by the way, knows not to run jobs in these special MSDB databases and only run it on the actual MSDB on the instance. But of course, when you fail over and you use a listener, it knows now, oh, I'm on primary now. So I can run agent jobs both in the MSDB and the contained AG and on the direct instance itself. So we talked a little bit about the cloud. There is a new easy way to deploy availability groups in the portal. And I can encourage you to actually look at that. And remember, you can actually extend your license for disaster recovery using the async replica in Azure VM. We talked about the fact that business critical auto deploys and maintains an AG, but we have a different system for failover detection. So you only need one secondary to be hardened to actually do that. We have this new thing called managed instance link. So what I'd like to do is kind of skip forward and show you a demonstration of what that looks like. So this is brand new, and I realized this. We were here a year ago talking about this. You remember me being here a year ago and, hey, we got this managed instant link thing, right? And it's an offline system. This is your first look at a failover between a SQL 2022 instance, a bi-directional failover between these systems. Behind the scene, we're building a distributed availability group for you, even if you don't have an AG. So this is a new experience in the latest version of SSMS to go and create a new link. By doing a new link, I'm effectively setting up a DAG between my primary in SQL 2022 and managed instance. It does not require a business critical service tier. It could be general purpose. 
Because guess what? Behind the scenes, we already have the AG technology enabled for you to make this happen. So I'm going to the process of just taking a SQL 2022 and setting it up and connecting it to managed instance. When I'm doing this, I'm obviously seeding the database and I'm replicating the database. We do not yet have the ability for you to manually seed. So we're gonna use direct seeding to make these databases work in the beginning. I realize for very large databases, that could take some time. This is the initial public preview for it. So I'm connecting to my MI on managed instance. I'm showing you here uh, the MI I'm gonna actually go to because I need to deploy the MI first. So let me go over and get connected to it. Connect to my MI itself. And I go through the process of picking my primary and secondary, the primary being SQL 2022, the secondary being MI. And it's gonna go through the process just like if you built a DAG by yourself. And when this is done, I should be able to go over to Management Studio and I should be able to see the fact that these AGs show up. I time lapse it a little bit, but you can see now what's pretty cool in SSMS, you can see the actual AG and distributed AG in the system. And you can even scroll down into Managed Instance itself and see that. Let me flip forward and show you what it looks like from a DMV perspective. Even the DMV show this information. So if I go over here, I can run DMV queries and see the fact that I've got an actual primary and a distributed AG. Notice here it shows me the primary is the one in SQL Server and the AG is the one that's going over here in Managed Instance. Now, one of the things that's really cool about this technology, if you didn't notice or not, for Managed Instance, we have something new called a hybrid failover write. You have the ability in this scenario to mark the MI as a DR site, kind of like the passive scenario for EMs, and you do not pay for the SQL license while you're doing that. So if I say in my managed instance, this is an actual DR site, while I'm not using it, I'm not failed over yet, it's a free SQL license. But I'm gonna fail over now. So I'm ready to go do a failover, and now, now I realize this looks like a manual process, and it is, because this is a async distributed availability group. This is no automatic failover yet allowed for this technology. But I'm gonna fail over now, and when I do it, I expect my managed instance to be my primary. So I'm gonna come over here and refresh and see that, yeah, my database is there on my SQL server, but how do I know that you know, this is the primary, this is the secondary? So the, the GUI kind of shows you that, but if you go back and look at the actual DMVs, you can see now it's flipped. Kind of see right there, even the GUI it says secondary, and right here, if you look here, this is the primary that's not marked secondary. But I like to go over and look at these actual queries uh, on the catalog and DMV views to show me, hey, I wanna make sure which one is the primary replica. And if you run it again, you're also gonna look at things like updatability. You can see now that for SQL 2020, it's read only. And for MI, it's read write. So you're like, Bob, that's pretty cool. That's interesting. But I wanna go backwards. Now you can. So I've got the system where the MI is the primary and SQL 2022 is the secondary. Let's say SQL 2022 went offline. If you bring it back online, we'll synchronize it back just like we do for AGs today. And then when it's synchronized, you can go through the process of actually doing your failover. Now you need to make sure it's synchronized. You can decide for yourself if it's a forced fail back or a planned fail back. Because think in your mind of the manual, the cluster type equals none scenario. That's what we've built. Cluster type equals none, where you do a planned failover or you do an actual forced failover. In this case, I know I'm synchronized back, so I'm gonna say planned failover, but I'm going back to 2022 now. I was an MI. Let me go ahead and connect to the MI system itself <clears throat> and go through the process of saying, hey, I'd like to switch back. So I'll say, I'm gonna keep the link around because I wanna go back and forth and just switch back and forth. Say finish here. Now, as you're seeing this, all of this is scriptable. All of this is scriptable with T-SQL and PowerShell. So if you'd like to do this in a more automated fashion, you can absolutely do this. When I refresh here, now my MI is back my secondary and SQL is my primary. So finally, after a year of promising you <laughs> that this technology would be available, it's been in private preview for a bit, now in public preview for you to go try out yourself. Questions about this one, about how we've implemented this and how you can use it. Works for standard edition too, by the way, yeah. What's the question? The question is, where's the listener? There is no listener yet. There's no abstraction here. There's no auto failover. This is like a DAG you use yourself where you don't have a listener. That's something we need to add into the system. That's where they want to do, have an abstraction point so your app doesn't know and can go back and forth. Crazy, crazy 45 minutes. Whoops, go ahead. Yeah. 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 Well, no, um, actually you can't. So if SQL 2022 is down, there's no way to connect to establish it back. 
what you probably have to do is remove the link on the managed instance side and go back and start again, like a reseeding operation. Okay. Yeah. Right, but it's, da it's been down, right? You have to probably recreate the link in that case, but come talk to me and I'll, I'll see. Did they, the team solve that for you or? Oh, is that okay? All right. Well, if that's what they said, that's the truth. One other question and then we'll end and I can stay here for questions afterwards. Yeah. I'll have to take that offline. I mean, off the top of my head, I don't remember. There are some of those kind of things, but I, I didn't cover that today, but I'll have to talk to you offline about that. Hey, thank you for being such a great audience. I'll stay around here. Take your questions afterwards. Thank you. <laughs>